Hello, good to see you and thanks for staying with News Central. According to the African Development Bank, harnessing individual potentials of Africans' human capital is the most sustainable key to economic transformation and social progress. Our conversation today will be an exploration of Africa's human capital development efforts and why it matters so much that we get it right. Our performance in World Bank's inaugural Human Capital Index in 2018 was dismal. No country from the continent was ranked in the top 50. Her largest and second largest economies, Nigeria and South Africa, ranked 152 and 126. East Africa's economic powerhouse, Kenya, came in at 94, while in the north, Egypt ranked 104. I doubt much has changed since then, considering we almost immediately went into a global pandemic. In 2020, the same World Bank said, a child born in sub-Saharan country could expect to achieve only 40% of his or her future productivity, even with complete education and full health. And while it is no longer news that the number of youth will double to 850 million by 2050, what is distressing is that nearly 38% of the youth in sub-Saharan Africa want to move permanently to another country. The irony of all of this is that the future is Africa. Her people is Africa's greatest resource. So, what is the plan? Various bodies, the World Bank, the UN, the AU, all have strategies aimed at human capital development and central to all, it seems, is the quest to end poverty. My guest today on One Slot is Dr. Kweku Adams, an Associate Professor in International Business and Management at the Bradford School of Management in England. He is the founding president of the Ghana Scholarly Society in Europe, a learned society with a focus on finding solutions to challenging problems facing Africa. He's also a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy and currently serves on the editorial review boards of the Thunderbird International Business Review and the Africa Journal of Management. He has so much to his credit. We'll just leave it there for now. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Adams. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. What exactly do we mean when we reference human capital? How would you define it? Well, um, our conversation today, uh, thanks for having me in the first place. Um, I want to focus on the micro, the main things that matters to Africa's development. So my definition or the conversation is going to be centering around four key themes. Uh, the first one is institutions. Uh, the second one is local context. Next one is innovation. And finally, local or informal cultural systems. So let me go back to your question looking at human capital. Two words make human capital. The first one, of course, is human, and the second one is capital. There are three or a couple of different philosophical ways of looking at human capital. The first one is a naturalist theorist or naturalist philosophy. Those who believe in God says God made Adam, you know, and God gave Adam gifts. The evolutionist theories also believe that, yes, uh, humans just came to the earth and they, they, they develop as they go along. If you combine these two things together, whether you believe in the, the first theory or the second one, there is an element of gift and there's also an element of development or evolution. So I, I, I normally do search work for, for the, some of these keywords. And the first word I search for but human is a Hebrew word that means Adam, basically, or Adam, and it means ground. And the more you search a bit more further on this, you see it means grounded or learned or refined mind of a person. Okay, that's the first aspect. The second aspect is capital. Now, 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 um, capital is a Latin word in the 1640s, means capital. It, it means wealth employed in carrying on a particular business. Okay, um, uh, they, Dr. Adams, I need to interject here because the idea is for anyone watching, irrespective of their academic background, they should be able to follow the conversation. So if you could break it down in the simplest terms, 
if you want to describe, well, because every time we talk about we need to develop human capital, explain it to a layman. And to a layman is the knowledge, the skills, the abilities, or the characteristics which is required of any human being to be able to carry out any work that is given to him. That's human capital. The key thing that I was going to when you interjected was the aspect of capital. Okay. Capital is what we paid for something we don't have. And the value in a thing is what determines the amount somebody is willing to pay for. So how much the mind is refined determines how much people are willing to pay for. So when you combine these two things together as human capital, a refined mind or a well-grounded, well-learned individual, combine those two things together will be human capital. Fair enough. Just an embodiment of what makes us human, if you want to go to the religious aspects that you referenced. So why is it imperative that we develop it, really? Well, when you look at any, when you take any business organization, uh, what are called the firm, there are five key resources that any firm needs to be able to succeed. And the first one is human capital or human or human resources. The second one is financial resource. The next one is information. Next one is location, or if you like, land, what we were taught in those days in A-level economics as land. The next one is enterprise or entrepreneurs, some people with the right ideas and the skills to combine all of these to produce goods and services for a profit. Now, in any economy, the amount of people who are able to combine these resources utilizing people's skills, knowledge, to produce goods and services for a profit is what creates jobs for people. And when you have people working, they have money in their pocket, they spend it on other goods and services, which then create jobs for other people. So you can see the economic development is built around businesses and not on politicians. And that is what we haven't managed to get right in Africa. Fair enough. Um, what are the UN recommended guides to measure human capital? Well, I don't think the whole idea of measuring is so crucial. Of course, I can give you some pointers. Um, um, the first one is economic benefits, uh, the, the creation of capital, and then the non-economic returns. So it's measured in terms of economic returns, non-economic returns, and um, the creation of human capital, how much money it's required to develop people. Okay. If you look at the measures, for example, a cost-based approach to measure it, what they call in the U.S. guideline, I did a bit of research, is PIM, P-I-M, Perpetual Inventory Method, whereby we look at a person and how much the person is, a person's mind is refined and how much the person can add value to organizations and how much the person actually add value to their own lives as well. And that is over a period of time before the person goes to pension. So if you have a person who gets uh, just A-levels and somebody who gets a first degree or PhD, what will be the difference in the value of the lives of these people in terms of their contribution to businesses and their contribution to their own lives? The next one is the lifetime income-based approach. Other indicators used like literacy, school enrollment, educational attainment, and all of that. That is for UN. But for us as Africans, we need to define what matters to our industries what matters to our local context, what resources are available. These, these, of course, these UN written reports are based on Western. They did not have Africa in mind when they wrote these, these sort of measures. We need to define what matters to us as Africans. And then once we redefine the standards, begin to train people to do what our nation needs for us to succeed as, as, as a continent. Okay, you, you, you seem to have hesitation as to the measuring criteria, but in order for us, the, the idea of measuring human capital is to allow us develop, to grow, basically. The caption of this conversation today is the future of Africa uh, with uh, human capital development. So measurement is necessary. In other, it might not be accurate, but it gives you an idea, don't you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, measuring is there, and, and that's, that's very crucial. Those are, those are written down. I mean, those are things that you can find with your normal Google search about measurement. Now, I think I've already given you measuring yeah, in terms a couple, of cost-based. Yes. Yeah, measuring in terms of um, a lifetime income-based 
uh, and then we've got the indicators based approach uh, measured in terms of literacy, school enrollment, educational attainment. Okay, so you, you are, are saying that these are these measures are from uh, UN and from European countries that might not really apply to us. So what should be from your experience, be Africa's mood of measurement, because measurement is necessary to get some assessment done. I'm not beating down measurement, as you can tell. That yes, I agree every, with you. Every academy, we have to have a starting point. But we as Africans have got what I call um, local context or local factors matter. Because when you look at the Europe, you look at Europe, for example, they have industries for which they have institutions that train them to perform a particular function in those industries or in those companies. Back in, the, in, in the about 40 or 50 years ago, Japan had degree programs for painters. They had degree programs for those engineers who fix car, uh, you know, some car doors or fix ties and all of that. And as time went on and machines were able to do those things, um, Japan's universities and institutions changed the approach and basically looked at developing people from actually managing systems rather than actually doing the things. So if we look at measurement in Africa, in African context, what does it mean to us as Africa? We've got Nigeria with a huge oil deposit, and most of our oil is refined overseas. So we need to look at retraining or training our people or our human capital to be able to do what we need as a nation to succeed because the foundations upon which Britain was built, the foundation upon which Germany was built are quite dissimilar from Africa because the resources available to us are quite different as well. So that's why I'm tilting towards understanding local context to define what does it mean to develop a human mind in the African context. Um, are there no um, common thread that we can, common indices that we can take from what Europe has done, for instance? And yes, they're a lot more developed. And if, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're looking at the, looking at local, each country, for instance, that would be cumbersome and take a whole lot of time when we have so many distractions going on. Would we be dedicated to a process that truly wants to refine uh, measures for, um, you know, assessing human development? So what would be some of the key qualities of the measuring uh, criteria that other people use that Africa can modify maybe and change as we go and get new um, um, information? That's, that's a very, very good question. I'll give you some, some data here quickly, very quick data, before I give you the, the answer. Number one, if you look at France's population in 1900, France's population was 40 million. Okay, 40 million. 2022, forward, fast forward 2022, France's population is 65 million. So France's population is increased since 1900, 100 years and above, just 25 million. Okay, 2022, France population is 65 million. 1900, it was 40 million. Look at UK. UK's population is currently 68.6 .6 million. And I'm just giving you rough, rough numbers based on just normal Google search. 1900, UK's population was 30 million. So there's been an increase over a hundred year period. UK's population is increased by uh, 38 million. Let's go to Germany before I come to Africa. Germany's population as of 1900 was 56.3 million. 2022 is 83.3 million. That's 27 million increases. Now, let's take just two countries in, in Africa or West Africa. Let's look at Nigeria. Um, uh, 1900, I'm not sure how accurate this data is. But I know at, at independence, the data is accurate, but I'll give you anyway. 1900, Nigeria's population was 18,920. I don't know how much that is accurate, though. But at independence in 19, when you, I think you had your independence day recently, I think last, uh, you know, recently. Um, yeah, anyway. just two days ago. Mm. Two days ago. Okay, how many hours old is Nigeria now? 60 what? 62. Okay, at 62, Nigeria's population was 45.2 million. Now, it is 260 million, if the, if the data is correct. And I know there's more people than, than 260 million. So... That is 217 
million increase. Now, I, I listened to a BBC um, radio program, which I contributed on, on, on phone, and, um, and it was about the bulging populations in the world. China is one of them, India is one of them, Nigeria is one of them. And the argument has been that by 50 years time, Nigeria's population will grow to 400 million, okay? Let's take one more country, just to, in order not to bore you with too many statistics. Ghana, where I am from. Okay, Ghana's population is six, was 6.7 million at independence. Now it's 37 million. We've grown by 27 million. If you look at the numbers, it's astonishing. Now, if you look at the UK, for example, what they've done or what they did during, let's say, 50 years ago was they had universities, the Russell Group's top research intensive universities. They had polytechnics, and, and those are the institutions that provided training for craftsmen, artisans, very early skilled jobs. Uh, even mechanics were trained, plumbers were trained, and they were very, very highly educated, you know. And if you look at the O levels and A level system, it just prepared students. And now, I think it's 2005 or so, can't be very specific, but when Tony Blair became Prime Minister of UK, he did something interesting. He said, let's look at the students we are producing. Let's divide the educational system into two pathways those who will stay for highly academic subjects and those who will do vocational training programs. So if you go to any typical college or typical uh, sixth form college in any UK uh, institution, you will find that they are B-tech programs and are A-levels. A-levels are students who are able to, of course, conjure theoretical concepts and all of that. And the B-tech or vocational programs are those who are very practical and hands-on. We need those who can build aeroplanes. We need those who can build cars, who can develop things, who can create things. There was an example of a video that I saw recently in a Ghana, a young boy who's been able to create a drone. And this person doesn't need to go to university to learn a degree and to go and learn a bunch of theories which doesn't apply. When well, that, that, that's something we can get copy from them that is really good you have attested to it. But I want to circle back to the figures that you um, highlighted um, it is no, there is no question that there is concern about the astronomical, uh, astronomical connotes some negation, but no, um, the huge growth that Africa is experiencing. A lot of us, when I started this conversation, I said, the future is Africa. And the reason that comment comes up is because of the population that we have. So should that be something that we worry about? Is that the fact that their population is smaller, they are able to maybe micromanage their, uh, I mean, kind of fine tune their human capital development. And for us, you said it, we need to find our own unique way. So should our population be something of a negation for us or is it something we should celebrate and harness? On one hand, a huge increase in population like Nigeria presents a huge market for which goods and services produced in an economy would have demand for. And as I said before, we live in a demand-driven economy, or the economic systems works around demand and supply. So if you have more people demanding for goods and services, it means there will be the need to recruit more people to work in those companies. When people work and they earn money, they do two things with their money. The money can be saved in banks, or they can spend it on goods and services. Either way is good because when people, more people save money and he goes to the bank, everyone is saving money, goes to the bank. The banks get a lot of cash. And because the banks don't chew cash, they will give the money as uh, loans with cheaper interest rate. The laws of demand and supply will set in. Once companies can borrow more money to expand the business, they can afford to uh, expand and then uh, you recruit more people. You see gradual development of the economy. So on, on a positive hand, we should not worry about the bulging population. We should rather seize the opportunity of the increase in population and to capture the opportunity that, that presents in terms of demand for goods and services. Why is it that most multinationals are looking for going to China? Because there is demand. Okay. However, if we don't do anything about training the young boys in the street of Lagos, providing them with training and the right education to function properly, 
then those are the guys who turn out to be our problems. So you, you have two things or two sides of the coin. It's brilliant to have a great population because it serves a demand for our economy and it's good for the businesses. I've been in UK for close to 20 years now, and the last two years I've seen huge influx of Nigerian nurses coming to work. I'm, I'm actually going to bring that up at some point if we have the time uh, during this conversation. But let's okay. um, circle back and see what we can... We're looking for the positives at some point. And we know that where we were, you use the instance of uh, population growth uh, to make an analogy. I want to use... Where we were, say, 10 years ago, when it comes to human capital development and where we are now as Africa, um, how have we grown? And what are some of the uh, things that you've seen in the transition that we've gone through that we should sustain? I think for that, is a very, that is a very, um, very, very good question. We have grown, um, but not in relation to the speed with which our population is growing and not in relation to the speed with which other countries in emerging economies like China and India are. The, the largest economies in the world, Nigeria is supposed to be one of the largest economies in the world. In fact, if you look at just by GDP, uh, if you don't, maybe you know, or maybe you don't, or maybe your viewers might know or not, but Nigeria's economy is bigger than that of South Africa, okay? In terms of GDP, in terms of economic productivity. So, the good things we have done, if you look at, there is not a single university you go in the UK, you wouldn't find in Nigeria. Uh, and I have, I, I do get lots and lots of students coming from, from Nigeria, from Ghana, from Africa in general, that I, I, I do teach. But the key thing is that when you compare the quality of work written by students from Africa to students in the UK or in anywhere in Europe, you see a huge difference. The difference in criticality, the difference in thinking, the difference in the application. That is what we don't have. That is what we lack. So many people are getting degrees and there are polytechnic system in Nigeria and same thing in Ghana. Uh, people are getting H&Ds, they're getting degrees and private universities have sprung up, which is good. And the number of people getting education is good. It's always the best way to go. However, when it comes to training for problem solving and critical thinking, we lack. Very much. We, so. I, I still area. struggle to add my numbers <laughs> at, you know, past 40. Okay, uh, let, let's see what we can do with this part of the cup. The gaps in human capital is getting wider. Um, the figures you highlighted earlier clearly shows that it's easier for them to manage than um, us here in Africa. So um, the changes in Technology, for instance, uh, demography, um, and then you, you also have the issues with uh, climate change. Can Africa catch up? <laughs> that is an interesting question. I think Africa can catch up. But as I said before, we need to look at our institutions. Number one, what does it take to teach at a university? I mean, most of our researchers do not have time to do research in Africa. They don't have time. They don't have the resources. And whereby you got the European Union and UK government providing tons of pounds of money for uh, university lecturers to do research, there is none of that in Africa. So you cannot expect for those without resources to do it. Okay. So that's one thing that needs to um, change institution. We need to support our local institutions to grow, to succeed, to adapt, to change, to the changing needs of the market. The second thing is local context. Local context matter. Our institutions must respond to the needs in the market or of the changing nature of the businesses that we are growing or that we are setting up. We have a lot of micro businesses. You go to University of Birmingham, they are giving scholarships for Nigerians and Ghanaians to come and study market women and how they do their business and how they succeed in Ghana and Nigeria and Africa. Our governments don't give nothing for that kind of research. We need that to, uh, to, to be put in place. The next one is um, at local, the informal systems. You know, we, something we have thrown away, when the Queen died, and if you watch, those of you who had the chance to watch the, um, the, the, um, the, the process and everything, yeah. you would notice one thing, and that Britain's culture is very, very well embedded in everything they do. We are ashamed of our culture, we as Africans. We don't, 
want to. That, 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 that's debatable. That's debatable. A lot of persons will say, that's debatable. Maybe some Africans, not all Africans. <laughs> go, sorry to interrupt, but go ahead. I, I just needed to interject and defend those that are, you know, vehemently standing up for our culture. <laughs> exactly. We need our culture to help us shape and reshape what we teach to our students, how we assess their level of knowledge, and what we expect for them to be able to achieve. Now, innovation, when you, th when you talk about innovation, your mind will race quick to computers. But innovation is not just in machines. Innovation in the ability for people to think and solve problems locally. In fact, um, there's one professor I really like very much. His, his name is Professor Peter Buckley. And he wrote a book, and in the book he talked about globalization. He said, we've heard enough about globalization. Globalization is good. Let's not put globalization under the bat. It's good. And localization is also good. We cannot say local context does not matter, but we need to globalize. Globalization. We need to teach students to think about globally, to, about the global issues or solving global issues, and also understand the local context and be able to solve local issues. All right. You know, when, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That did. Um, what, what you've said so far is some of the things that we need to do, some of the things that we need to um, uh, review. But there are existing strategies. Uh, from AU and other regional bodies. We'll take a look at some of those strategies and what they are doing in trying to grow human capital uh, in Africa. After this very short break, please stay with us. Good to know you're still with us. Now, let's go back to Dr. Adams. One of the AU strategy is to work to implement key policies and programs that they already have on primary health care and prevention. What would be your assessment of your work in this regard? Because like it or not, we'll come to nutrition and other specifics later. But for now, health is wealth, they say. What's your assessment of your work? Well, I mean, the, well, let's go back to the second element of our conversation, which is capital. Now, capital is what you pay to get something or what you need to be able to get what you want. Now, for human capital, sadly for us as Africans, the value of the training we get and the rent we can extract from it is so small and in a way that we tend to go, go where our training and our skills can be properly rewarded. And the reason why you have more doctors and nurses leaving, and that's why I fear for whatever uh, strategy the AU have or has is that it might not work because people are living in droves because they are not paying the right amount of money for or placing enough value on the scales of people. So when you have an imbalance in terms of how much I can get for the work I do, how much I can save to be able to build a normal house and be able to send my children to good schools and all of that, it has a huge impact on my decision to whether to stay or to leave. So I'm not very, I'm not privy to the exact strategies the AU have or has to push for the healthcare agenda of, of, of the union, but, but I fear that uh, because the world will pay for talent and the UK is competing with Nigeria for talent. Canada is competing. US is competing. Germany is competing. So if we don't really see our institutions look at our local hospitals and the doctors training and the things we need to provide to bring them up to speed and up to date, we're going to lose all of them, and then we go back to the cycle. No, as you're, as you're, as you're, what you're saying just triggered a thought, and that has to do with if these countries are happy to steal our talent, it means there are still aspects of our system that works when it comes to education. So I think the, uh, the, the part that you are emphasizing on is providing 
commiserate um, um, remuneration for the services that they are providing. So how can we do that? Because at the end of the day, if you look at the AU is basically to push policies and it's left for individual countries to adopt or not. So how can we push in such a way that these people don't need to leave? Is that even two possible? Things. Okay, two things. One, the, A or the African Union, or if you look at, let's say, UK or U Europe in general, as the population numbers that I gave you earlier on, you see that they've got shrinking populations. Basically, you've got a lot of, a lot of people, all the baby boomers now, growing now with so much money and they cannot do anything. So they need carers to support them to, to live the rest of their lives. In Africa, it's the opposite, basically. You've got young, energetic people, but with skills, relevant skills, those who have been able to, who have managed to go to medical school or nursing school, with the relevant training to, to, to do a good job, but the reward is not good enough. That's one. Two, even if the reward is not good, but the educational system is good, and they can trust that their children will be properly educated um, without them having to pay or find money to send them to private schools, then fair enough. So we need to have the infrastructure systems in place. The money that we spend on other things must be spent providing education for the young children. There must be incentive. That's one. Two, capital will go where rent can be attracted or extracted. If I've got a glass and you're going to give me one pound for this glass and somebody else is going to be, give me 100 pounds for this, of course, common sense will tell you that the one pound will lose. The glass will always go where there is more reward. That's the nature of rent, you know, basically. So to be able to change that, the first thing is we need to be able to provide quality education for the young people so that parents who decide to stay back home and work as nurses and doctors would not have to worry about their children having quality education. That's number one. Number two, our streets must be safe. I should not be afraid walking in Lagos in the night because if that is the case, what is the point of risking my life? to provide a service for, for, for a nation that doesn't appreciate it. So these minor systems, are, I call them minor because it's not the main subject of discussion, but they are very crucial in sustaining the human capital that we've got and to build on it. Top thing is that the less we have, the less we have, and we're going to lose more. But if we have more and we build on that, we have mentorship on the job training, of the job training, and then gradually we grow as a nation. But, but basically, human capital will always find its way to where there is more reward for it. And that okay. is why so, I fear that nothing and that's why we're That's actually the reason we're having this conversation. The, the idea is to make suggestions, no matter how wild it might seem, um, we put it out there, and who knows, um, a smart African might see it one day, and it will trigger something uh, in them to help us grow. Um, Africa, yes, we have what it takes to do what we want to do, but we need help at some point. Um, we know that if Africa develops, it affects every other part of the world. The migration issues will be addressed and all of that, and we know that um, uh, World Bank, uh, the African Development Bank, the UN and other bodies are focusing. Uh, one of the uh, Millennium Development Goals is to, um, SDGs, I beg your pardon, is to um, end hunger, remove poverty. That seems every other thing that we're, we're doing uh, to grow human capital also, aside from education, has to do with uh, uh, addressing the issue of uh, endemic poverty. What would be um, the key partners that you feel are actually adding value to Africa's effort within some of these, I mean, the names that I've mentioned? Okay. I mean, we haven't got all the time in the world to talk about everything. I published a couple of papers on um, Africa's uh, human capital and how growing Africa's human capital will make Africa's economy competitive, international competitiveness, you know. So uh, that is something to, to, to look out for anyway. But there is one thing I think is very crucial. And, and the first one is that we, as people who are in a diaspora, 
who have got the experience of getting uh, Fed degrees in Nigeria or Ghana or Africa, now getting further education in the West, we need to look back and contribute back home. Uh, and that's what I've done. Basically, I said to myself, um, being in a, a UK university is good, it's nice. Teaching all of that, getting money and all of that is good, but we need to do something. So what I decided to do was to bring all the uh, Ghanaian academics together on the one umbrella. There are so far almost 120 uh, Ghanaian scholars on one platform. And what we've got, we've, we've managed to develop a website and we're going to demonstrate uh, our uh, the wide range of skills that we've got. And if any government institution needs us, if any educational institution wants us to contribute, by bringing the knowledge we've got, we are very much happy to do so. That's one way that the diaspora can be tapped to give back. Okay. Now, there are other um, institutions that, or that others have formed that tries to do this. Okay. But the key thing is having a safe place back home where you can go and you know you're not going to be robbed at gunpoint and that even when you're willing to give back um you're not going to lose anything as a result of that, I'll give that, you one that, that that is that is actually key that's actually key you have to uh, you mentioned the education infrastructure and safety if we have this three we might begin to say okay maybe we're going somewhere we're developing something um another thing still staying with the conversation around poverty uh, eradication. Eradication is a strong word, but at least efforts to reduce hunger. One of the things that is nutrition, uh, that's one of the strategies that the um, um, World Bank, the UN, and other regional bodies are taking up. Um, what are some of the key efforts? Okay, let me broaden that a bit so it's not so narrow. Healthcare, education, jobs, and skills, even though you um, have some doubts as to how much we are investing in vocational education. But what would be your assessment of the efforts to, you know, grow this in Africa? Well, I mean, you know, look, um, let's, let's not kid ourselves. We have got the land. We have got the space. We've got the farmers. Um, we've got what it takes to grow our own food and not import toothpicks from, from, from China. We have got bamboos to make our own toothpicks. We've got the land to grow our own rice. Uh, the mindset of the people needs to change. And that's what I went back talking about, the values that we instill in children that go to school. We need to begin to instill values, African values. We need to value what we have. Um, our, you know, in the UK, for example, you go to the supermarket and you want to buy organic food, there's a 10% organic, 20% organic, and 30% organic. To buy 100% organic is much more expensive. Everything we have in Africa is organic. I don't know how much that has changed though, because I've left the system for about 20 years. But we have the real thing. We have the big deal. We need to cherish that. We need to value it. Okay? And the government needs to support the various initiatives, not just depending on EU or depending on uh, USA, because every pound, every fund or every pound or dollar that is given by uh, another country is given with their own national interest attached. They would have to get something. Well, is that, is that always the case, really? Because I know that some of these um, bodies, financial institutions specifically, have these fundings that... Because if they don't help some of these countries get out of poverty and harness their human capital, it also affects the kind of business that they get and the revenue that they get. So there are long-term um, loans, I think, that has very minimal... Um, a repayment, um, um, I don't know about finances, but I know that some of these banks, like African Development Bank, for instance, wouldn't want to um, give something for Africa's development that would be detrimental to the people. So is it so bad, really, to accept help when there are no strings attached or minimal strings attached? Look, we Ghanaians went through economic reform programs in the 1980s. And we went through structural adjustment programs with handouts from IMF and World Bank. So much money that came in. Nigeria did the same thing. Economic reform programs, structural adjustment programs. Ghana at the moment is struggling, and they are thinking of going back to IMF. All of that money that we have received has not and cannot and will not change Africa. We need to look at what we have got and what we can do with, it, with what we have. You know, and what we have is people. We have culture, we have values, we have not cheating people. 
we have, you know, when you look, if you buy any food from, uh, go and buy pizza from Pizza Hut or any, the, the amount of emulsifiers that they use. I mean, talk about vegetable oil. Have you ever pressed a vegetable and seen oil coming out of it? We have palm oil, but we don't even value it anymore. So the, the, the point I'm trying to make is not to neglect the support we're getting from, from uh, uh, external agencies, but that help over the years has not changed our problems. It has not changed our cause. We need to look at ourselves and say, this, we are African. Look, some of the money we went to IMF to borrow, I can count three or four Nigerians that can give you that money. I can count three or four Ghanaians that can give the government that money that they're going to IMF to borrow. We do not need external handout. It has not worked. It yeah, I'm just, work. I'm just, I'm just sensing that. I mean, the the years of experience has, you know, um, uh, hurt your uh, <laughs> your ability to accept any of these loans from these people because you feel there is something attached at the end of the day. Let, let's let's move away a little and see if we can cover a little more grounds. Let's talk about the four E's. I know you don't put much stock in there, but the World Bank Group in 2019 talked about um, the four E's, and that's empowering women, employing women, um, enhancing access to reproductive health services, and educating girls. How does this, in your opinion, advance human capital development? That is an absolutely wonderful question. Um, the last three years, I've spent most of the research I've been doing the last three years is focused on women and the impact of women within organizations. And I've published a couple of papers on gender diversity within uh, multinational corporations. And now my attention is now focused on the importance of women in small and medium scale enterprises. Now, the first paper we worked on looked at women and innovation. What is the role of women in bringing innovation in organization? And we found significant interesting findings that women makes a lot of difference when it comes to innovation. The next paper we did looked at women in the environment. If you have a woman who is a CEO, how does that shift the focus of the organization towards more expend, spending money towards the environment? I mean, the theory actually says that women are more, you know, nurturing, they're more caring, they care. If you look at the growth of Africa, the base is actually women. The market women, the education for children built around women, and we need to give women more space, more, more room to be able to explore, and, and, and we, need to support, we need to support women. In the UK, there are funds for women, if women entrepreneurs, there's the support for them. If you go to Germany, it's the same thing. We in Africa need to do the same. We need to value our women because the women are special. I'm not in any way, shape, or form trying to say men are not important, but there is an absolutely crucial role that women can play and have to play if we are to grow as a, as a continent. But of course, we in Africa believe in patriarchism and we, we live in a very patriarchal society. And therefore, when a woman achieves something big, we think that, who is that to be able to do that? I think education needs to go on to shift that, you know, that focus. And, I, and I'll tell you, when, I, when, when we got that paper published, I sent one of those papers to gender ministry in Ghana. That, hey, we've got a nice paper here published. We've got about... 4,000 companies, and, and our findings shows that women are so good when it comes to innovation and environment. So here are the paper. May, perhaps you can use that to amplify the role women can play in small and medium-scale enterprises, in multinational corporations, in starting up new businesses. Guess what? I did not get any reply. <laughs> I'm sure that shouldn't be much of a surprise, but we'll keep talking. That is what we do best. We talk and we keep the issues in the front burner in the hopes that uh, one person will pick it up. But I want to stay with one aspect of the four E's, and that has to do with access to reproductive health. Uh, the decisions that women make as regards their bodies and what they want, how it affects, because in, in America we hear the abortion rights uh, controversy in other parts. Um, I think in, um, I'm not sure now if it is um, Sudan, I'm, I'm, I can't be exact, but there was, there is a country where a young girl um, recently um, lost her life as a result of not uh, conforming to setting rules. So specifically, Iran. Iran, thank you very much. Um, so how do we 
you know, balance all of these inequalities in the face of trying to raise human capital if we say that a lot of value should be attached to the role that women play? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm no expert in key things, some of the key things that you raised. Um, my expertise lies in the area of human capital and what firms can do to develop human capital. But some of the issues you raise, being having born and raised in Ghana, I left Ghana at a very young age, at age 27 or so, you know, and, and that helps me to relate back home and see what can be done. And I think going back, the key thing that I said earlier on, the four key things matter a lot. And the first one is institutions. Okay, institutions consist of the local institutions as well as the formal institutions. Okay, we need to have respect for the role women play. We need to get people to understand that without the women, we will lose out. Without the skills and endowment that God is giving to women, we will lose out. And therefore, their role in society is very crucial. Now, you raise the issue of uh, women and their bodies and what they want to do with it. Of course, we live in a... Um, um, religious, let me use the word religious, religious societies in Africa, um, and with very, very different views about what women should wear and what women should not wear. And again, it, it, it goes back to the issue of what is, what is acceptable in, in, in this society and what is not acceptable in this society. The fact that a woman wears and covers their own body uh, does not necessarily mean they're going to be good people or they're going to hold good values. And the fact that somebody dresses really bad doesn't mean they're useless, you know, either way that you look at it. But the key thing is the value we place on them as a woman. And okay. In, um, in, let, in, let me, in the interest of time, sir, I'm, I'm sorry I keep interjecting half the time, but in, in the interest of time, I'd like you to speak uh, quickly on... We've touched a lot of areas. Um, as a scholar and somebody who watches events from, you know, the other part of the world, what would be your suggestions as to... Um, areas we can improve upon in our quest to develop human capital in Africa? I think I'll go back to my uh, four key points. First one is local context. We need to understand the industries. What are the industries that are growing? We need to develop knowledge bases around each industry. We need to have a university that is focused on or a department or departments focusing on the growing sectors within the economy. The governments need to provide funding for research into those areas. In Canada, I've taught in Canadian universities for three years as well. There was a professor at the University of Calgary, uh, sorry, University of Alberta, and he spent 25 years of his, of his life researching how to separate um, oil from sand, because um, Alberta is, they've got a lot of oil deposits, but it's mixed with sand. 25 years of his life spent to find the, the technology to be able to separate that. And he found that, and basically he, he passed on after that, that breakthrough. But that is what has transformed up um, um, a Canadian's economy or Alberta's economy. We need to provide funding for research. Okay, that's one. We need to understand which industries are growing. We need to develop knowledge bases around that. In every successful economy, you see there are specialized sectors and there are specialized institutions. If you go to Germany, for example, they've got their big oil manufacturing. They've got a great technology or technical institute supporting each industry. We need that. And Michael Porter's theory supports that, about the five diamonds. It supports that. The next thing, we need to look at our institutions. We need to change the way we do things. We need to support the young and the youth, those who are growing. The, the, the old must understand the future is no longer in your hands. It is in the hands of the youth. Everything we need to provide, like mentoring, supporting them, providing funding for the youth, making room for the youth to express themselves without fear. Uh, that's very, very crucial institutions. Uh, so I've talked about a local context. I've talked about local industries. And the last one I want to uh, talk about is we need to have a mindset of globalization or globalizing. We need to think globally, but locally. What is the global economy? doing? What can we prepare ourselves as Africa? You've got the AFCTA, and I've currently I've got a PhD student who is researching on 
at the African Continental Free Trade Area. I've got PhD, okay. second year PhD. Think student. localizing global um, trends for our own uh, benefits. Uh, I'm afraid that's the more time will permit us, uh, Dr. Kweku Adams. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Thank you for sharing your time. It's been great. Thank you so much for having me. Bye for now. Okay, I echo what is already known in closing that ambitious evidence-driven policy measures in health, education, as Dr. Adams said, not just school education, vocational education, as well as social protection can help Africa recover lost ground and pave the way for today's children to surpass the human capital achievements and the quality of life of the generations that preceded them. All we require is the will. Thank you very much for watching. I hope to see you next time. My name is Felicity Isiwike.